Aidan, our Senator of Antonio Sarri. And thank you very Government much. Scale. <laughs> I very much too, like, like my colleagues, uh, welcome the opportunity for us to have this debate in this forum. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Stephen Kinsler, who's here with us uh, from the University of Limerick and a, a leading economist who's going to provide a report of our, our, our debate. So perhaps uh, I'll be careful of what I say about economics uh, on it. I'd also like to thank the Library and Research Service for the briefing on the compact they provided us last Thursday. Um, but I'll do my best in this debate not to be doing uh, any Cliff Notes version uh, but more to give you my thoughts and how I feel um, at the current time on the compact. I, like many others, have to actually make up my mind to which way I shall vote come the referendum. To a degree, I feel that such a pronouncement would be premature, as we don't have all the information yet. For instance, we do not know the time frame in which the Commission uh, is proposing that we shall ensure rapid convergence towards their respective medium-term objective. Nor do we know the format of the automatic correction mechanism the government is examining. So while I look forward to examining the proposed constitutional amendment the government is currently drafting, uh, and exactly what question will be put before the people of Ireland, uh, without the full information, I believe we can only look at the compact in its macro sense. The treaty isn't about making new rules. In fact, it's actually about enforce, enforcing existing rules regarding the conduct of budget policy, already allow, uh, laid out in the Growth and Stability Pact and the Six Pact, six -pact reforms uh, by cementing them into national constitutions or into primary legislation. Thus, for the most part, what we're seeing is strengthening of a current framework. The principal twist for Ireland will be one that will disqualify countries which have not signed up from getting aid from the permanent EU rescue mechanism, the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, from March next year. The key novelty, I believe, is the agreement that each country in the Eurozone ought to agree that its annual structural deficit shall not exceed 0.5% of GDP, and this rule shall be introduced into its legal system at constitutional or equivalent level. But we do not know the specifics of how the government plans to introduce these measures at the constitutional or equivalent level. Consequently, it's a del delicate balance for us between the compact itself and the legislation uh, which will actually arrive out of it. Um, in fact, perhaps maybe I, I could send a message to our friends in Europe. When, when I was preparing for the debate today, I was very much reminded of a quote uh, from Monet, who, who everyone will know is the chief architect of European unity and a, a political economist. And Monet once said, if you change the context, you change the problem. And perhaps our European friends might, might take note. However, in the meantime, what we need to say honestly to the people of Ireland is that a yes vote will not necessarily deliver us an immediate return to prosperity, any more than a no vote will instantaneously end austerity. I'm the first to admit that the compact, I believe, actually has some flaws, it, it, it's abstract, but equally the alternative to its adoption is hardly preferable. So let's not sugarcoat the situation. What we face is a case of least worst scenario. I believe that the Irish people are engaged and savvy enough to appreciate the reality that we're living in. Even if we were to reject the treaty, we still remain legally bound to most of the fiscal discipline measures proposed in the compact under the Stability and Growth Pact and the Six Pact reforms. In essence, the compact is merely a restatement of our commitments, only now other countries will be expected to fulfil these commitments. However, as we've seen in the case from Spain only yesterday, these targets are unlikely to be enforced without a degree of flexibility on the part of the Commission, so long as the government behaves proactively. The treaty, I don't believe, will protect us from a repeat of mistakes of the past. Uh, in fact, it's a testament to how much money was squandered by our boom year government that the structural deficit would have only run afoul of the compact twice uh, between 2000 and 2007. As Michael Taft of Unite has noted, had the fiscal, compact, uh, fiscal treaty been in situ, it would have made no difference whatsoever to Irish budgetary policy. So rather than being revolutionary, the measures contained within the compact would effectively be economic business as usual if our current times were not so unusual. Rightly or wrongly, we found ourselves in a situation where we no longer have the opportunity nor the resources to institute a Keynesian approach. Like Chancellor Merkel's Swabian housewife, thriftiness is the only tool we've left in our arsenal. The question now becomes, are the terms of the compact ones which we can realistically meet? 
By the government's own estimate, the 2015 structural deficit will be 3.7% of GDP. This amounts to a shortfall of over 5 billion still needing to be made up uh, through at least another two to three more years of very tough budgets uh, post-2015. Thus, to say the commitments in the compact will not lead to further austerity is wishful thinking at best and semantics at worst. The compact will not address the economic needs of the country uh, and what we need in the country is growth. And I'm not saying it should, but it's not addressing the economic needs. As Mr Crichton pointed out in this very House in a previous debate, Recovery is not simply a question of cutting and cutting, rather by achieving go growth over an extended period, we automatically reduce the debt to GDP ratio. So in my opinion, the compact and the provisions connected to it are not connected to growth, which we do need to be debating. In fact, I wonder if the compact will achieve anything beyond reassuring the markets and ensuring or continued access to funding from the ESM. And maybe that's not a bad thing, but maybe we should accept that's what it is. So let us be forthright with the Irish people and clearly state that this treaty is not a panacea for the Irish economy. Nor is it a debt sentence. It's a choice between maintaining the ESM safety net or facing the deficit crisis alone. I would equally like to uh, concur with my colleague Senator O'Brien about the need for an information campaign and awareness. I think there's many things that the Irish people would like to be having an opportunity to vote on. But what we will be voting on is the compact, the fiscal compact. We will not be voting on the future of the Europe. We will not be voting on many other issues that we would like to vote on. Uh, we will be voting on the fiscal compact. So let's be honest with the Irish people. And let's also remember, it is not just a compact for Ireland. It is a compact for all the countries that sign up. At the moment, 25 countries had indicated that they wish to be part of this, as has Ireland. So the rules that will apply to Ireland will equally apply uh, to other countries. Um, so let's see how the debate progresses. As I said, I look forward to seeing how the government proposes uh, to put this into our constitution or primary legislation um, and what will be the question put before the people of Ireland. And when I see that, I will then make up my mind whether I will be supporting a yes or no vote in the forthcoming referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Barrett, you have eight minutes.